thanks everyone for, for coming. I hope you enjoyed the film. Um, I'm just going to do some quick introductions and then uh, start off with some questions. So we've got uh, Leilani Farha, who is the UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, you obviously saw her uh, highlighted within that documentary uh, on, on basically what she, like, pieces of what she does as, uh, as a job. And it's uh, a lot more broad than that, but she is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, uh, world's top watchdog on housing, and set out to reignite the idea that housing is a social good, not just an asset or a commodity. She's been in that role since 2014, and has presented reports to the UN on homelessness, the connection between housing and life itself, treatment of housing as a commodity, and its consequences for people who are poor as well as the middle class. And she's traveled to India, Chile, Portugal, among other places to investigate whether governments are meeting their human rights obligations with respect to housing. She's also launched a new initiative called The Shift, which we heard a little bit about uh, near the end of the film. It's a global movement which calls for everyone to approach housing as a human right, not a commodity. Now she's a lawyer by training and has worked to advance the rights of the poor and marginalized groups throughout her career. She's the executive director of Canada Without Poverty, and in that capacity, she's been instrumental in launching an historic and successful constitutional challenge to provisions of the Income Tax Act, limiting free speech of charities in Canada. And she's was awarded an honorary doctorate by a Canadian University <coughs> recognition of that work. She's also the, or, or maybe Barbara Schiffler Award for her commitment to advancing women's rights, and most recently the Jack Layden Social Progress Award for leadership. <laughs> That's very good. Um, and then we've got Jeff Morrison in the middle, who has served as Executive Director of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association since January of 2016. Since the, that time, the CHRA and Jeff have worked closely with the federal government to develop and implement Canada's first ever national strategy, national housing strategy, and Jeff is also very active in the community. He currently sits on the board of directors of Way Home Canada, the new Community Housing Transformation Centre, and chairs the organization of Ottawa Pride Run. He's also served on the board of directors of Bruce House, Operation Come Home, and as president of the board of directors of Centertown Community Health Centre. And in 2014, he ran for Ottawa City Council in Somerset Ward, finishing second out of 11 candidates. And then on the end, we've got uh, Professor Carolyn Whitson, uh, Whitson pardon me, and is, who is currently the Bank of Montreal Scholar at the Institute of Feminist and Gender Studies at the University of Ottawa. She's also been in Australia at the University of Melbourne, and so she's sort of new back, as she called herself earlier, uh, sort of an immigrant back to, to Canada. Um, but she has uh, led a six-year community government university partnership transforming housing that focused on scaling up the quantity and quality of affordable housing. She's also the lead editor of the Building Inclusive Cities, so Women's Safety and the Right to the City, and the author of the Suburb Slum Urban Village Transformations in Toronto, Toronto's Parkdale Neighborhood and also the Handbook of Community Safety, Gender, and Violence Prevention Practical Planning Tools. So lots of, uh, we've got some great panelists up here, and I wanted to kind of start off with asking Leilani. Uh, Blackstone featured pretty prominently within that film um, as an aspect. Did you ever get to meet with them? <laughs> and if so, what came out of it? Yes, yeah, so you saw that they rejected my meeting. Uh, oh, first of all, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out to the film. I'm really interested, I'm always interested to know how audiences feel about it and how you, how you experienced it. Um, so, with respect to Blackstone, as you saw, they, they denied me that meeting. Um, after that, I wrote to them several times and re-requested meetings. And um, they just kept saying there wasn't any appropriate time. Um, subsequently, in March of this year, I wrote what we call a communication, which is a very formal kind of legal letter. I wrote it to Blackstone in seven countries, um, saying that I thought these kinds of practices are contrary to human rights. Um, Blackstone um, wrote back immediately, actually. Um, and in it, they said that they would be happy to be in 
constructive conversation with me. Um, obviously, it was a jab that to date we hadn't been in constructive conversation, but whatever. Um, so I used that as an opportunity to reach out to them and ask for another meeting. I was going to be in New York this past October, and could we meet then? Um, they didn't reply. Um, then we, just before I left, we asked again, and they said no. Um, then, with no reason, just unable to meet. And then we um, screened the film in New York uh, just a few weeks ago, in October, and um, lo and behold, I heard from the Swedish consulate that was hosting that screening that Blackstone um, had contacted their offices to say that they're concerned that the film has some errors in it and uh, factual um, errors, uh, and that they would like to meet with the Swedish consulate about these factual errors. Frederick Gerson, the director, being Swedish. Um, so the Swedish consulate wrote to them immediately and said, we would be really happy to meet with you. And but to my knowledge, Blackstone never wrote back um, and never appeared. Like they, they offered certain times when, when they would meet with Blackstone and they haven't responded, as I understand it. So they're playing some kind of game. Um, we suspect that they were someone from Blackstone was actually in the audience at one of the screenings in New York. But how would we know? In the start of the film, you sort of witness the dichotomy uh, between someone profiting off of Toronto's hot housing market and those suffering from under it in terms of the rental market. So I'm going to a two-parter question for, for all of you. Um, what are the roles that municipalities, provincial governments, even, even the UN plays in controlling or Allotting a, or getting a handle on the real estate market and, and handling adequate, affordable uh, rental housing as, as well as, as the real estate market. I'll start with uh, you, Carolyn, if you want to address. <laughs> so a bit of, it's a, it's a, a very uh, large question with a lot of angles, but to, it is a very large question. I guess. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave a slide in the UN because Lenani knows more about it than I do, except that the UN is there to um, uh, protect international standards, international rights. The federal government has a majority of funding, the majority of tax revenues, at least in Australia. I just got back from Australia but in, um, uh, for 16 years. Um, the federal government takes in 80% of tax revenues, um, uh, provincial or state governments take in about 17%, local governments take in about 3%. So you've got a problem if housing, which is costs a lot, if a big infrastructure item is left to the level of government that as activist as it is, as forward thinking as it is, is also the level of government that has the least powers and the least money. What local governments can do, I think you saw a bit of this in the film, is that they can um, sometimes uh, land bank buy up properties that are under threat if they have the money, which may need to come from other levels of government. Um, it's actually the provincial government in Canada that's responsible for rent control. They can give powers to local governments, like for instance, um, Toronto uh, works to stop conversion of rental to condo. Um, they can get inclusionary zoning. Uh, local governments can set up community land trusts, but they need, um, uh, again, a little bit of funding and support to do that kind of thing. I think we saw how the urban land question is a really important part of the picture. So it kind of takes all three levels of government in Canada, plus the UN uh, patting us on the head, to, for us to really make a kind of shift. And I think I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, like how, how does the national housing strategy fall into, into regulating people who need housing? Right. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the University of Ottawa for putting uh, this on. Uh, it's my alma mater. It's great to come back here, so thank you. Um, and, and I haven't actually said this to her yet because this is the first time I've seen the film, but I just want 
to thank Leilani for doing this and putting this on. This was, this was somebody said at the outset, this was your for a treat. Uh, and we did, and we were. And I just want to thank Leilani. And one thing as I watched that, um, that really struck me, and that I thought, oh, geez, how does she do this? Is when you go and you hear all those one-on-one -on -one stories, and you hear the people that are being evicted or facing eviction. And I mean, in a role like what you do, you have to have empathy to the, you know, to the thousands that agree. But there just comes a point when you're, you know, at the end of the day, you're a human being, and you know, you can just. There's only so much compassion, I think without actually internalizing it. But I know you do it great, so, so thank you uh, for the film and for everything with you. Back to the question, though. Um, I mean, first, I think so many years, the role of the federal government in housing has been essentially to help facilitate those who, you know, in one way or another can, can access or can, can find it, uh, finance or access to housing on their own to help them do so. So the role of CMHC in many ways uh, has been, has been you know, to, to serve as that, as that uh, uh, providing access to capital for those who either want to build or for those who want to own housing. Um, the, you know, the concept of the shift that, that Leilani talked about in the film that has a whole number of different meanings and I think one meaning from a CMHC and a national uh, housing standpoint is that the federal government and CMHC more particularly hopefully over the coming years will make that shift to becoming more of uh, a body that will help facilitate access to housing to those who've been least supported. Um, and I think in the national housing strategy, you know, I'm an optimist by nature. I think in the NHS, we saw the first building blocks and the foundation that was being laid for that. The NHS, when it was announced two years ago, was essentially a $40 billion package of measures that was intended to do a bunch of things. Um, one, it provided access to capital for predominantly nonprofit cooperative. Uh, housing providers to renovate existing properties and build new, so that's good. We put in place some money to help people uh, offset or subsidize their rent through through uh, uh, what's called the Canada Housing Benefit, which by the way has not even been introduced as of yet. Um, it helped uh, extend rent subsidies out 10 years uh, to 2028. Uh, and of course, as, as we know, it introduced uh, a, a, a Right to Housing Law, which was just passed into law in June of 2019, uh, called the National Strategy, the National Housing Strategy Act. And among other things, and I will probably talk about it a little bit more, but among other things, it requires the federal government to maintain a housing strategy directly aimed uh, at the most vulnerable populations. And that was important because a national housing strategy at the end of the day could be pretty much anything. It could be as a way to help facilitate you know, home ownership for those again who can probably already afford it. But it didn't. It said, no, we want to focus on those who can least afford it. And so, are we there yet at a point where we can say, okay, we've checked the box and we've helped all those people out there who need access to housing that wouldn't otherwise be able to access it? Not by a long shot. But it laid the foundation. And again, being an optimist, CMHC has also now set this new goal. This is my last point. CMHC has also now set this goal that by 2030, um, they want to see, or they want to get us to a point where every person living in Canada has access to housing that meets their needs. As, as their CEO, and I know there's a couple of you from CMHC in the room, um, as your CEO has said, that's a big, huge, hairy, audacious goal. But that's okay. Um, let's set big, huge, hairy, audacious goals. Um, the thing we need to now do is figure out how we get there. And, and that's where the tools that we started putting in place will help, but again, long way. Thanks, and apologies, I do have this terrible cold that seems to be going around. Uh, so my thoughts are a little bit scrambled, but um, first I just want to respond um, to the issue around being rapporteur and meeting all these people and how much empathy you have to have. Um, you do have to have a lot of empathy if you want to understand human rights violations. Um, but I've been interested because I don't feel that there's a limit to that. I think the more I empathize, the more empathy I have, if that makes any sense. Um, but I'm so busy, I haven't even had time to really reflect on so much of what I've seen. And when I do reflect, start reflecting on it, I, it's too much to bear, actually. So I probably have some survival. I think that's what you meant by, I'm, you know, I'm just a human being. I think I have some survival mechanism in place. Um, there are some stories that stick with you, uh, experiences. Um, 
the look people give you that you just will, I just will never forget. It's completely life altering. Um, in any event, um, back to international human rights law. <laughs> Less emotional, maybe. Um, so interestingly, at least to me, all levels of government have international human rights obligations. Most people don't know that, and certainly most governments don't know that. So there's this sense that international law is something that these national level governments sign and ratify, and it really only pertains to them. Um, my first report as rapporteur was actually on the human rights obligations of subnational governments, so local governments and um, um, uh, like provincial or city governments. And basically, under international human rights law, Anyone exercising government authority has international human rights obligations. So if you think about that, it's a little mind blowing, you know. So it's like the the welfare office administrators, the social assistance administrators, who administer shelter allowance, they actually have international human rights obligations. Social housing providers in this country that remain social, that is, they, they receive their funds from different levels of government, they have international human rights obligations. It's pretty mind-blowing to think about that. Um, that being said, you know, what Carolyn said is so important. I mean, when we're looking at the resources required to continue and to, make, to continue to build and to maintain stock, we're looking at a federal government that's resource heavy and we're looking at cities that are on the front lines that are, are resource poor. Uh, and so that's something that has to be obviously taken into consideration. What I like to say is I like to see national level leadership. And so those bold, visionary um, commitments and goals and timelines like CMHC's 2030 um, challenge to itself is exactly what we should be seeing in a developed, rich country like Canada. Federal government standing up and saying, we're going to do this and we're going to you know, do it by 2030. It's very cool. It's also in keeping with the sustainable development goals, um, which the government is committed to. So um, I really applaud that kind of national level drive and vision. And that should make it more comfortable easier for lower level governments to that, that want to, that are progressive and that are willing to recognize their international human rights obligations to pursue them. And I get asked that question in Canada a lot now. So, so the city of Toronto is entertaining a rights-based housing strategy, a 10-year rights-based ha housing strategy, and they're looking to the federal government. They're saying, well, we can do this, sure, we can do this, right? Because the feds have done it. And, and that's a real, that's the kind of interaction between different levels of government I want to start seeing more of. I, I really see very little of that globally. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Well, actually, that sort of brings me to, to a question I wanted to ask. We just had an election in Canada, and, and obviously a minority government elected. So how do you see minority government affecting the, the implementation of the national housing strategy uh, we're, we're two years into it, uh, at the 10-year strategy. So, Jeff, I don't know if you want to get a kick at that. Is how how you see this minority government being able to to implement the goals that they had set in motion? Right, and, and I'm sort of smiling because my colleague in the audience, uh, Tim Ross, uh, the CEO of the Cooperative Housing Federation, and we were just on the panel on the, on the weekend at a conference and on it, this exact topic. Um, <laughs> Put it this way, given what the, some of the alternatives could have been, this actually wasn't a bad result for housing. Uh, I, I don't think I need to say parties or names of people that could have been elected. That would have been a very much uh, awkward turn of things uh, for, the, for the affordable housing sector. Uh, put it this way, the benefit of, first of all, having the liberals in power is uh, it's pretty safe to say that the measures that were, have already been introduced and that were part of the strategy announced that have yet to be rolled out will all still be rolled out. Uh, in other words, I don't think we're turning the clock back in, in any regard that way. Um, the, what I call it, maybe unfortunate part of the Liberal platform though is that they didn't actually go much further in the election. They kind of took that, you know, we've, we've dealt with that one, we've, we've, we've ticked that box, we don't need to do much more. 
Um, but that's where the MPP uh, element comes in, and I say them because in this minority parliament, it's most likely they will be the ones supporting uh, the government, at least for the next uh, couple of years. And the fact that Mr. Singh went out and said, okay, I will make it a condition of supporting this Liberal government if and only if they support affordable housing. And of course, during the election, he had raised uh, the concept of, of building at least a half a million more affordable housing units. So one of the things, one of our messages to the NDP, in fact, we're trying to communicate that this week to them, is hold their feet to the fire on that one. Use that as a leverage, as a, as a bargaining chip with the Liberal government. Um, find ways to increase that capacity, because really, at the end of the day, the best way to ensure access to safe, affordable, affordable housing is to ensure a proper supply of it. Um, and so I think the political dynamics of that should be hopefully one in which, and with NDP support, the Liberals will ideally embrace that, because they have shown that they, do, uh, that they are committed to, to the affordable housing sector. So between those two components, I'm optimistic. Uh, again, I'm a glass half full type person, um, but you know this is minority, so it's a wild card. You know who knows how long this government will last. Um, but overly, I'm still. I think I'm optimistic. It seems to me to be a win-win. I mean, you're not going to piss off the West by getting folks money for affordable housing. Um, and the fact is that we need the kind of scaling up that not just the NDP but the Green Party talked about in order to start building the kinds of systems that can meet the needs. I don't want to be a troublemaker or anything. I think the national housing strategy is a good start for a national housing strategy, but I am going to say it's not an actual national housing strategy, because if you were doing a national housing strategy, you'd be saying that we're going to be at 41.1 million in 2030, and that means that we're going to need uh, 2.2 million uh, new houses, of which 41.7 are going to need to present, are going to need to be affordable to people earning late, less than 80% um, of median income. And we already have a deficit of 1.6 million houses. So this is how we're going to be building um, a rather large number of house uh, um, dwellings in the millions over the 10 years to 2030, of which um, the, not the majority, but a substantial minority has to be affordable to people. 6% um, of the population of Canada earn less than 20% of median income. These are folks, these are households that are going to be homeless without adequate social or other form of nonprofit housing, public housing, the market cannot provide for them. There's another 60%, 16%, excuse me, of households that earn between 20 and 50% of median income. It's going to be difficult to meet those needs at an affordable cost, let's say 875 a month. That's not available in, in Ottawa right now without a really big investment in nonprofit housing. Even when we're talking about moderate income people, key workers who are earning about 50 to 80 percent of moderate income, the most efficient way, and as recently reported out of Metro Vancouver, to meet those needs isn't um, low cost or no cost land from governments, although that's incredibly important. It's not the most up-to-date construction techniques, let's say wood frame as opposed to concrete thing. That's really important. It's non-profit development. That is the only way you're going to keep moderate income rents at, um, let's say, um, 1,200 a month, substantially increased. And that can help cross subsidize to say 875 if you have lower income households paying, let alone the 325, which is the maximum that most low income households can pay. So that's what a national housing strategy looks like. It's looking at the big picture of who's living here now, who's going to live in 2030. Indigenous or First Nations and then with Metis families are uh, rapidly growing at 5% of the population. Bigger households are going to need bigger units. 
population is rapidly aging, we're going to need more supportive housing in the form of assisted living for people who are 80 and 90 years old and are rapidly um, losing mental and physical capacity to care for themselves. We need to drastically up supportive housing for older people, for people with disabilities. These aren't people who are going to magically um, run down the ladder of the, of the housing continuum and become, um, you know, people who are going to buy houses again. They're 80 years old. They're past that nonsense, you know? So we need to start thinking seriously about what the national strategy would look like and then start meeting those needs. So the national housing strategy got the principles great. Thank goodness, thanks to the work of Leilani and lots and lots of folks, they're talking about the right to housing, but it's only a start. So we need to keep on pushing it up. It sounds like we need something beyond 10 years. We need 30, 40 strategy, so a little bit longer term. Yeah, can, I, can I just wait a little bit? Yeah, I'll be quick. I'll try to be quick. Um, a little known fact is that on oh, this political party, and what does this mean about this election where we've got a minority government, potentially with the NDP with the balance of power? A little known fact is that um, the NDP had not traditionally uh, supported or really um, embraced the right to housing. Um, so years ago there was a, a bill that started all of this stuff about a legislative right to housing that was introduced by the NDP and it actually did not include any human rights language at all. It was really about building social housing. That was going to be our national housing strategy. And a few of us <laughs> got wind of it couple of us and uh, weren't satisfied and thought you know amendments needed to be made to this bill to include human rights um, principles and standards and the NDP were not that interested and so we shopped those amendments around to the liberals and the liberals were interesting this is before Harper uh, when before when uh, Harper was Prime Minister uh, and that bill had all party support, actually, and then an election was called and, and, and it died a quick death, unfortunately. Uh, but it had all party support except the Conservatives, sorry, I should say that. Um, so so it, that's just an interesting thing. I want to say that what's happened with the National Housing Strategy Act, which is the legislation that attaches to the actual strategy, is actually historic. It is unbelievable that a government in Canada has recognized in legislation that housing is a human right. Canada has historically since, um, especially since 1996, really resisted housing and all social and economic rights as human rights. I mean, they've never wanted to acknowledge them as full-blown human rights. And here we have a Liberal government in its last session recognizing housing as a human right. It's, re it's really a moment for this country to go, whoa, and that's where I dovetail with what, how Carolyn ended her comments, um, because I actually think we're in new terrain now. And I, while I agree with all the comments, we need more of this and you know more social housing, more nonprofit housing, etc. But what I feel we actually need to do is pause, take a step back, say, okay, now we have in legislation the statement that is Canada's housing policy recognizes housing as a fundamental human right. Well, that actually is not just a nice phrase. It is. It actually has content and meaning. And it has to be, guide what we do in terms of addressing the housing crisis facing this country. And that will mean certain things. It will mean creating a certain amount of new stock. It will mean regulating the financial actors that are really destroying existing affordable housing and eating it up. The film only talked about, didn't really talk about Airbnb, but that's a, Airbnb as an investment model is eating up huge amounts of our affordable stock as well. Um, what we didn't really show in the film is, you know the fellow, the Frosty the Snowman fellow? I think that line is in that film, yeah. Um, so he's living in an SRO, a single resident occupancy place in Parkdale in Toronto. Um, that's, for those of you who don't know, that is like, that is like, as he says, he is just one, just shy of, of street homelessness, right? For sure. Um, and you saw the solutions. <laughs> SROs are being bought up by these asset management firms, and what are they being converted to? Funky studio apartments for students. 
So, I mean, that this sort of thing, a human rights approach, will guide the government in dealing with governments in dealing with all of these different aspects. So, my my sense is, I mean, Carolyn knows the numbers way better than I do, and so does Jeff. Like, I this is not my game. Um, when we get into the details of like what's needed. Um, but it's, it's obviously not just about building, and even if it is about building, human rights is something to say about what's built, how much money is spent, how it's spent, etc. We're, we're losing affordable housing way faster than we're building affordable housing. That's, that's definitely part of the issue, and, and short term rental is part of the reason. Well, so part of that dovetails into what I wanted to ask next. We, part of the bill touched on. A lot of them touched on that sense of community that people feel in the urban. So you've got that sense of community, and then you've also got the areas where people are being full stepped. And you've got not only one evictions, but also just forced evictions. We have a situation, we still have a situation here in Ottawa specifically with regards to a whole neighborhood essentially being told they had to move. Karen Gay, that is, is that neighborhood. And I know Leilani, you were you were sort of part of that. You you heard from the tenants there. What challenges do these these tenants face uh, around the world, as we saw from the film, in, in trying to be able to to stand up to these corporations that are trying to force them out, and also to find other housing that that fits their needs in in the fact that we've got these hot housing markets around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's despicable that governments aren't absolutely protecting those sorts of neighborhoods. It's despicable. I mean, it's contrary to human rights, of course, but I mean, come on. I had a very interesting experience with Herringate and with the fellow Derek in the film in Harlem. But in Herringate, so I read in the newspaper, The Citizen, that I read 100 households in a community in East End, Ottawa, was going to be uh, evicted and their homes were going to be razed. I was like, what the, what the, what, a hundred homes? That's a lot of homes. Uh, so I then, and they have just referred in an article to this landlord, landlord, Timber Creek, blah, blah, blah. So then I just Google, I just was like at my desk, I love doing this, like distraction from my other work, Timber Creek pops up. It's not a landlord, it's a freaking multi-billion dollar multinational asset management firm. Okay, different ballgame. So then I'm like, okay, this is different. This is this is something else. Heard about a community meeting, I decided to go. I just like went. I didn't tell them, I don't even think I told them I was going, I just decided to go. And I walk, I, I drive to the community center. I'm from Ottawa, I've lived here a long time. I'm driving to the community center I've never been to before. And when I walked in the room, the penny dropped. I, I, and it, it amazed me it hadn't come up in the news, and it, the penny dropped. I was probably one of three white people in the room, and the room was completely packed. All of the Herringate residents are racialized community from different parts of Africa, Northern uh, Africa, different parts of Africa. Tons of kids, total community, everyone knew each other. It was like totally amazing. Uh, right, the white people in the room besides myself and the lawyer was uh, several people running for city council, basically, and the federal uh, member of parliament for the area. Yeah. Uh, so the penny drop. I mean, these communities are completely wrong. Completely vulnerable. So what what can I say? I mean, government should be protecting. These are precious communities. Derek living in Harlem. I mean, after after we filmed, I mean, after what they showed us, we and I had quite a long conversation. And he said Harlem is incredibly significant to him. He is African American, and once pushed out, there's nowhere he's going to be able to afford in Harlem. Big blocks are being bought by Blackstone and the like. Poof, there goes his connection, which was probably tenuous to begin with in light of racism in the US, right? But there goes poof, his connection to his ancestry, his, his, his history. Uh, we, this, these are, like, it's so urgent to me. I feel, um, why are we not protecting these communities? I'm baffled. 
sorry, going on at length. Well, um, I think that uh, unless you either you want to see you know, the, the other thing I was going to say, when, when hearing it happen, you know, I've been thinking about this, would the new break to housing legislation, the National Housing Strategy Act, would that have done anything, or could that have done anything to, to help that situation? Um, and it goes to something Carolyn said, which is, you know, that legislation, which was just passed in, in June, so not that long ago, um, it's going to be interesting to see how it rolls out. And so where, for example, let's say in, you know, a year or two or five years, you get another hearing to happen, could the mechanisms within that legislation help have done anything, or will it help do anything for that community or for communities just like that anywhere in Canada? Now, I don't know the answer to that, right? You do. So what Lonnie does, here's where, I mean, my thinking is, is so of the structures in the Act, you have this new national housing advocate. And, and I know Kyle and Baxter, with the Community Human Rights Commission, is helped setting it up as we speak. Um, that office will essentially have investigatory powers. So in other words, any person, any community, anyone can come to it and say, look, we have a human rights complaint about something happening to us. Um, advocate investigate this and the advocate will have the power to do so and has the backing of the commission to do so and can issue reports at the end of the day however the government there's no sort of punitive measure that that the federal government can take to essentially uh, force any kind of recommendation that comes out of that advocate's role at least not that i understand so that's a bit of a challenge the other challenge with the act and, and although i completely 100 percent agree it's historic and it's positive and it should and it does i think set forth kind of a vision statement for the federal government but its other limitation is that it only essentially applies to issues that fall within, as the act says, the purview of parliament, being the federal government. So if some of the recommendations and the remedies that we could have used to address Harrogate, let's say hypothetically fell within purely municipal, purely provincial domains, the act itself is limited. So I'm not saying that to be the downer of the room, I'm just saying that those are some of the challenges over the next little while we'll face. But the other thing I really want to see is how it applies in the courts. Um, can even uh, jurisdictions or individuals outside the federal domain use that law to challenge policy within the courts? I don't know. Um, but it'll be something interesting to see. And as a last thought on that, indigenous rights in particular will be very interesting to see, both from the advocate and the structures as well as the courts, because of course the federal government does have a judiciary responsibility for indigenous rights um, and so for excuse me, indigenous peoples. So that will be, I think, a really interesting thing that, that we'll be watching. And I'm going to be Pollyannish just for a second. 1980, Milton Park, big developer, buys up a bunch of property, wants to redevelop it, really strong community, fights back, forms eventually a community land trust, and now it's four decades later, and there's 1,600 homes, 15 co-ops, seven social housing projects. It's a fabulous part of central Montreal. So once, and, and that was before the federal government got out of the housing game, it, Milton Park could not have happened without all three levels of government. Um, City of Montreal had a role, Quebec had a role, very much the federal government had a role. Yes, you know, Heron Gate could be, well, Heron Gate, it might be a bit late at the moment, but you know, if there is a strong federal role in uh, preserving affordable housing as well as creating new affordable housing, it could have had a very different solution. So that's what we've got to work towards. Can I just say that? Okay. Uh, I agree with what Carolyn just said. Um, I actually think one of the tricks about all of this is you think you saw a film about housing, you think we're talking about housing, but in actual fact we're talking about finance. And that is definitely the domain of the federal government. There. We're talking, this is all about finance. I'm, I'm telling you, it's all about finance. I am not the rapporteur on the right to housing. I'm the rapporteur on the right to finance. <laughs> um, I actually think an interesting move could happen. I think the legislation can have practical effect and I think it can have inspirational effect. The inspirational effect I'm hoping is that members of parliament might consider, for example, suggesting that a, a committee be set up, maybe, maybe through finance, uh, a study I mean, on the financialization of housing, for example. I'm seeing this happen maybe in Denmark. Um, and I think that's a really interesting move because I think we need to have a hearing. Or a housing advocate could do it once appointed. 
um, is to really thoroughly investigate and hear from a variety of witnesses, both on the fi finance side as well as um, the end user side, um, to, to see what's happening in our communities and what the impact is. I think there could be legislation that limits, for example, the number of units a single owner can have. That would, that would have mitigated Harrogate, for example, because they couldn't buy, they bought the whole freaking community as massive. And they're doing it in phases, getting, they already got rid of one Harrogate part of the Harrogate. Now this is the second phase, and then there will be a third phase. So there's interesting stuff going on around the world um, that I think our national level government could look to to see well, what could we do now that we know our housing policy is based uh, and recognize the story of uh, housing as a fundamental human right. Before we turn to the floor, I just have one last thing to ask. Is there a gold standard around the world? Is there a city or a country that's, that's doing housing right, affordable housing and adequate housing for their population? Um, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff happening in lots of different places, for sure. Some cities that you should look for, just Google like Berlin right now. Berlin is doing very cool things. They just um, had a law um, sort of accepted that freezes rents um, for five to seven years, for example. So rent cap for five to seven years is quite cool. The state of New York just adopted pretty, for them, <laughs> progressive uh, tenant protection legislation. Uh, and, and, and the developers are up in arms and the, you know, the real estate industry is up in arms. In Germany, when they passed that law, um, the uh, value, stock value of, of um, uh, stocks in housing plummeted. I mean, so there's cool stuff. Barcelona is really resisting um, um, Blackstone and they're expropriating properties and doing bank owned properties. So there's Finland, of course, has a very intact housing first program to address homelessness and it's a proper program and it's wholesome and they're actually the only country in Europe to be reducing homelessness. So there's stuff out there that's, that's cool. I just have to add, a couple of years ago I was on a, just on a vacation and we're in Vienna and we're, my partner and I were on one of those like hop on, hop off bus things and the, you know, the speaker thing came on and, and you know, where we're stopped you go, there's like a little, you know, a little audio description and suddenly we're at the first stop and they started talking about social housing and I thought, what the hell, like, you know, representing the association that represents social housing and thought, are they doing this just for me or what? No. Every stop we went to, and you know, you go in those hop on hop off, like the church here, the castle here, the building here, whatever. Every stop was about social housing. And I thought, what the hell is this going on? And there was Karl Markshoff and all these different places. And afterwards, you know, I asked like, what was all that about social housing? I thought, because I represent the association that that, you know, that, that represents some housing partners. And they said, no, we're just so proud of social housing in the city, 40%, I believe there's 40% of people in Vienna live in subsidized social housing. 60. Well, 60, 60, is it? The, 60. the most livable city in the world according to that noted bunch of left wingers on There you go, so, you know, <laughs> so there you go, so these are, are getting it done, but, uh, yeah. I'm sure you probably just thought, oh, robotics signed up for this session, but um, Yeah, no, this is just a basic, this is a tour, like, yes, anyway. Okay, well, I think we can take questions from the floor. If somebody has <coughs> some questions, you can start with the mic. Uh, yeah, so can you just uh, stand up and introduce yourself to the panel, and then we'll go around and get questions. Hello, Carol and Andrew, University of Ottawa. I just wanted to follow up on Lani's point about recent examples. I think Vanier is the most um, important example in Ottawa. It has become totally gentrified. It was a lower a francophone, um, low income neighborhood, and it's been totally gentrified now. That there, there's no uh, this, and they. What's happened, of course, is the low income francophones have been moved way out into the suburbs where they have to own cars or. And the, we all know about how bad the bus system is in the <laughs> outlying areas in Ottawa. So I think Vanny is a really interesting example um, where the same example you gave, which was Herring is more dramatic, but I think Vanny is an interesting case in, in what could have been done much, much differently. Thank you. 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 Thank
I think Van Gaen also lower town right near it, uh, where I think that it was recently said that the median house price was at four hundred thousand, which priced a lot of people out of, out of the market from yes. from owning yes. a home in that neighborhood. I actually live in Lower Town, and the one, the one of the redeeming features is some of the Ottawa community housing projects, because that brings, no matter uh, it's, it's parts of it, but it brings racialized communities, huge families, lots of fun, um, and, and much more. So I think that it just emphasizes, I think, that piece of Lower Town, the vital importance of Ottawa community housing projects and their ability to bring some diversity into what would be a totally gentrified uh, community. It, what is a gentrified community, but it maintains some of the um, access to housing of the racialized communities because of Ottawa community housing. Okay. So, so you heard your question, sort of how do we combat gentrification of, of, of these very established communities in, in areas like Ottawa? Well, I think the, the question that I think the man who brought up was the, the hugely important role of money from the federal government and getting really into so that people who have projects in neighborhoods can be supported much more strongly than they are uh, now because they don't have the finances to do it. Because there are neighborhood groups who are pushing for things in different communities, but they don't have the access to the financing. Hey, I'm Tim. I'm with the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada. Got a wonderful panel and discussion so far. A great film. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, so uh, finally get to watch the film. Um, so, briefing books are being written for the next government right now. You, you all spoke a little bit about what, what this next government means or what it could mean for uh, um, for uh, achieving the adequate right to housing in Canada, making sure that everyone have a, has a, an affordable place to call home. Say for, uh, say for an instance, and, and anyone can answer this if, if you wish, say you are uh, the Prime Minister's advisor on, on top advisor, let's just say, or the Minister of Finance's top advisor, and say, uh, Minister, Prime Minister, here's the number one thing we must do in the next six months to a year to get us on track, and here's one for uh, maybe even conversely, here's one thing we must absolutely stop doing um, as a federal government to get us on track with uh, um, this goal of, of uh, the uh, realizing the, adequate, uh, the right to adequate housing and, and uh, an affordable home for everyone. Thanks. I'll start with, with you, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the supply program. Uh, a supply program which, you know, it's not just simply bricks and mortars, it's also supply programs for land that's required. Uh, the federal government and the NHS did introduce uh, a new federal lands initiative, which is minuscule. It's, it's well-intentioned, but the funding under it is so minuscule. So uh, invest in that, which also, by the way, would allow the federal government to acquire buildings that are either underused, uh, need to be repurposed, um, does, and wouldn't necessarily need to be federal buildings, could be provincial and useful, could even be private sectors, so you can start taking back some of those ideal, those, those uh, unused uh, empty off empty buildings, um, and then put them into the hands of you know, non-profit developers, super non-profit providers who could then make affordable housing, uh, provide affordable housing to those who need it. So a supply program which you know takes into account a couple different things, that's what I would tell the Prime Minister. I completely agree with Jeff, so I'm not going to say anything more than <laughs> what Jeff said. Yeah, so I have a different approach. <laughs> um, I think first I would ask that the federal government commit to actually eliminating homelessness, all homelessness by 2030, in keeping with its international human rights obligations and the SDGs, and that they do so through a two-pronged approach. The first problem would be a fulsome housing first program that reaches not just those who are chronically homeless, but though, and not just those who are street homeless, that, but that also tries to reach those who are, for example, couch surfing. It's possible. That would be one. The second prong of that approach would be to actually look at, understand, and start addressing the causes of homelessness because a housing first approach doesn't work 
to end homelessness, right? All it does is it deals with who is already homeless. It doesn't stem the tide. So they have to figure out how they're going to stem the tide. So they need to understand what are, in fact, the causes that would then lead <laughs> to looking at um, measures immediately that could be taken to keep up this gobbling up, I mean, sorry, to stop the gobbling up of affordable housing, because that's obviously pushing people into homelessness. That's one of the drivers. So there's lots of things that could be done in that regard. This is probably pretty controversial, but you could, you know, immediately close the tax benefits assigned to real estate investment trusts. They're the only trusts that receive this preferential tax treatment. And they are the way, and I'm not going to get into it, so boring to explain what a real estate investment trust is. Go on to Google and look it up. Um, but it is the way in which so much of our housing has become commodified. Um, and the reason it's being done that way is there are huge tax benefits to setting that up, so you can close that. And rather than, look, I think we need a supply drive, so yeah, go on the supply drive, but what I would do is I would look at where do we have existing units that could be used to house people who need affordable housing. And I mean, the government made a mistake, in my opinion, in withholding the rent supplement program till whatever, whenever they were yeah. That program could have, if it had been rolled out, could could have actually done some real good, re really quick. I don't know that I believe in rent subs as a long-term option, but you said, what would I do immediately? And I'm tr I mean, we are in a crisis situation. And, and if you talk with anyone who's on the edge of in housing precarity, you can feel the crisis, let alone speaking to someone who's on the streets or you know, a family living in a car. I mean, this is a crisis. And so I'm looking at crisis solutions, and then I would be like, OK, we can breathe now. Let's figure out. I mean, supply is hugely important. I, I'm, I'm not discounting that. It just it takes a little bit longer than some of the other measures I've suggested. Yes. Hi, uh, uh, from the University of Ottawa, and uh, I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying, Leilani, about the gobbling up of uh, affordable housing. And the question was, is there anything in the National Housing Strategy or the new Act that would prevent actors such as Blackstone from eating up projects that would be built or projects that exist? And uh, the second question, which is a little bit different, is what is the situation uh, of, of Canadian uh, pension funds in regards to their ability to invest in uh, Blackstone and the likes? Yeah. Okay. Are we taking more questions? Or are we yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, to my, now I'm going to defer also to Jeff, but to my reading of the National Housing Strategy. There's nothing in there that would prevent Blackstone from buying up affordable units. Um, we know, for example, they just did that um, about a year ago in Toronto uh, with Starlight. They bought seven buildings in Toronto. Um, so we know they're active uh, here. Um, it should have appeared in Chapter 9, if I recall, because that was about mortgages and stuff. That's where I would have put it, but it wasn't there. Um, and pension funds, yeah, so we touch on it in the film and that's actually when I stopped being my porter and start living a normal life, <laughs> um, I will focus on pension funds. Um, I did some real cursory research, really cursory research, on to see if the CPP was investing in residential real estate or giving them, oh, they have their own investment arm, right, the investment. And I actually couldn't find, I couldn't trace that. Um, but subsequent to my own grocery research, someone told me that they are. So I obviously have to do more research. I was invited to a big conference in December that I don't think, uh, end of November that I don't think I can attend. And I think I could have gotten my information there. It's happening in Toronto. Um, but maybe these two know more about pension funds than I do right now. Mm -hmm. The school, the schools used to school pension <laughs> funds. Okay. 
Teacher pension funds used to invest in social housing, and I don't I don't know if they're doing that anymore. Yeah, I, I don't know about the CPP, but it's it's interesting. And actually, as I watched the film, that was the one through my head. You know, is that could we look at, at policies and investment for this for, for big huge pension funds like the CPP or the Teachers Plan of Ontario, etc. I mean, other countries have done this. Like Nor Norway has done it with their big huge giant with the oil fund that they have. They, they, they're social. Their social investing that they do, so it could. And that hasn't different. extended. That hasn't extended to housing. Right, yeah. right. More the social, the yeah. social benefit side of, of investing. Yeah. Right. Like they won't. They won't invest in dirty things like oil. Right. So there are some cities that are looking. The, the one thing that I know, and I, I wish I knew more, uh, is that there are cities that are putting out municipal bonds, and they're you know social investment, uh, and they and cities have to give permission to create. Housing bonds, but they're doing that, and that would be a really good investment. Cool. Which cities are doing that? Uh, Portland just got the permission to do that, and they're going big time, and so is the state of Oregon. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, can I just be honest? Sorry, I have like a fear logistical question. Sorry, I'm the 15 second. So, um, I lived in Switzerland for two years, and Everybody's like, Switzerland does everything so great. Well, they do, they don't, but whatever. Okay. So in my unit I lived in, and when you're like, I was explaining to me that if you're a builder and you want to build like a 20-story condo, for example, every fourth floor you have to set aside for public housing. And so the public housing is really stretched out all over the city. There's no public, like there's no big one public housing unit. And builders just know when they're making their application, they have to set aside such a percentage for public housing, something else which they call legacy housing, but we're not talking about that. Like, why is this not a thing? Like, how is this not a thing? Like, I just see all these condos going up in the city, and I just feel like, can this be done here? I don't understand why it's so hard to kind of wrap that into their building permits. Is there anyone here from the city at all? Okay. Sorry if that's a weird question. I just wanted to no, it's not a big question. No, it's a great question. I mean, you know, like the uh, city of Montreal has a 2020-20 bylaw that will come into effect in the beginning of 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, it's 20% uh, social, 20% um, uh, affordable with the rents. Yeah, it's none of that nonsense that they do in Ontario. Um, anyhow, uh, it's 20% social, 20% affordable, and then 20% family friendly, which means three plus. Uh, um, bedroom apartments, and that applies to um, any development over five units. And to me, if you're like um, affordable housing is not the magic bullet, but if you're going to do affordable, uh, sorry, inclusionary zoning, which is what you're talking about, don't don't waste your time with the small stuff. Don't talk about five percent. We're going to give all these benefits. Just apply it across the whole city and and make it meaningful because it actually. It's, it's an incredibly cumbersome process. I'm speaking as a planner now. Um, so if you're going to do it, don't waste your time with like little things. Go 2020, 2020, you know? Okay. The, the mayor of Montreal just recently actually uh, did not allow a particular project to go ahead because it didn't meet the social housing standards that the city had set, which is fantastic. She's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. She's awesome. <laughs> um, and so, you know, should we be saying the same thing to Jim? Should we be saying the same thing to Jim? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> He's not. Some cities don't have the bylaw that enables that to happen. They don't have a zoning law that gets for inclusionary zones. Toronto does, Montreal does, Ottawa doesn't, for mm -hmm. example. And of course, we should have it here. One thing that irritates me, though, about inclusionary zoning is if I go to uh, London, England, they'll say, 20, 20 to 25 percent inclusionary zone, uh, 20 to 25 percent social housing, or they won't say social housing, they'll say affordable housing. And then if I go to Montreal, they'll say 20 percent, well, not Montreal, I'll go to New York and they'll say 25 percent uh, affordable housing. And then I'll go uh, to uh, Buenos Aires, let's say, and they'll say 25 percent affordable housing. Well, how is it possible that all these different cities and all these different parts of the world all only need the same amount of affordable housing in their inclusionary zoning laws. It doesn't make sense. In other words, there is a disconnect between the, the percentage that's being set and the actual needs in, in the communities. It irritates me so much. It's like, 
they, I think the UK, you know better, Caroline, I think, I mean, but I think it was the UK that first did inclusion on its own, is that right? Yeah, and it, again, I have a lot of problems with inclusionary zoning for just the reason that Leilani said. I mean, um, in Montreal, actually 2020, um, 20 social and 20 um, moderate rental affordable is, it meets their housing needs, although it's only on new development, so it doesn't address the deficit, etc. So you still need other things. Yeah. But in other places, you just, it, it's classic Milton Friedman trickle-down economics. It's like, yeah, please give us a share of this ultra-expensive housing, please, 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 instead of, hey, we've got X proportion <coughs> of people earning X amount of money. If you want to develop here, you're going to develop X amount of X money. No, I mean, you know, it's it's planning scale 101. Thank you. Sorry, that was good. Hi. Um, I was actually at the, uh, the 14th uh, Lifespan Annual Assist of October 2017 that National Housing Strategy was, uh, was announced. Some of the question you something about national housing strategy and the uh, nonprofit sector and the subsidized housing said that the amount announced was only 20% more than previous committed. So it wasn't a huge new investment. It's repackaging with some additional funding. And so that's issue number one. Uh, I think the news about maybe a, a good option. I do uh, because you know, there are people with social conscience that can be pulled together to help the, the city and the federal government to uh, to expand the, the pool of money they have to go even further for, like I volunteered with CCOC and so on uh, for development and, and finance committee and they said because of 2% uh, loan for the three months, that act is equity rather than loan. And that gives them even more leverage. So we each have a way to leverage that if we can. And third, uh, you guys were saying that the government uh, funds, uh, owners fund Oxford properties uh, to build housing. And I, 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 I saw something this weekend. I believe there's 6%, they're planning to build 20% of the portfolio, and they're uh, planning to build the market. But I know CPP does have real estate holdings abroad. I don't know about Canada, and I don't know about residential. I know they do commercial. But, so those types of things which may be uh, being controlled by, partially controlled by the government or income by the government for the public, maybe they can do something. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Can I just respond to the first point you made? <coughs> um, it is true, a couple of months ago, the parliamentary budget officer released a report that essentially said, okay, even despite these you know, big ticket investments that were included in the NHS, that over time, the actual federal contribution to social and affordable housing has actually gone steady. It has not gone up with the 40 million that they announced. It's actually just essentially kept pace with the amounts that it relatively was at. Um, and in fact, for one particular case, we just barely touched on it this evening, but for indigenous housing, which is something that, that we uh, probably should talk about at some point, um, that the actual uh, relative shares of federal investment have gone down. Uh, and that's despite some targeted funding, very not a lot, but a billion and a half targeted for, for indigenous housing. Um, now, at the, so at the end of the day, is that a good thing? No, it's not. Um, I kind of, again, being the optimist, uh, say, but what could have been the alternative? And had that investment not been made in the strategy, then in fact there would have been a significant declining share of federal investment. So clearly, I think as we said in the outset, are we at the point we need to be? Absolutely not. But at least the foundations have laid. And I think over, you know, in some, we've, asked, we've talked a little bit with the next government, I think that's the real challenge is to build on what we've had and not just simply say, okay, we've put money towards it, now we're done. To, to touch on your point, Jeff, and to Leilani, your, your most recent report of you to, to, the, to the UN was on Indigenous uh, housing. And it seems to be that a one size fits all approach doesn't, doesn't work. For, for all these different communities around the world, uh, especially indigenous peoples. How should governments like the Canadian government, like other governments around the world, uh, tackle, tackle things like indigenous housing <coughs> issues, given that they've got their, their own set of, of, of concerns and issues of, of being taken away from, from their, their land? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I do think that Indigenous communities are distinct from other communities. Um, I do think no one size fits all works for all communities, but there's something very particular um, that has to happen with Indigenous communities in particular in light of the historical and ongoing colonization and dispossession of their, res their dispossession of um, their resources and, and lands. Um, I think that uh, federal government policy, policy should be guided by the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, the UN DRIP, as we call it. Um, it's really clear there, um, self-determination is at the core of the UN DRIP. Um, and it says very clearly that um, the eco social and economic development of indigenous communities um, should be you know, led by indigenous communities, basically. Um, and so I think um, in particular now, um, the national level government has to work with indigenous communities to develop an urban indigenous strategy that's really desperate 80% of indigenous peoples in this country live in the urban context. And so that's going to be essential, but it absolutely has to, the strategy has to be developed by indigenous peoples for indigenous peoples. That's just clear if it's going to work, um, if we want it to work. And obviously we would want it to work. Um, and then with that has to come adequate resources, adequate supports in enabling communities to develop the strategy. Um, Indigenous communities to develop strategies. It's not good enough to go, okay, we think that we believe in your self determination, go do it, right? Craft this thing. No, you have to build in supports and mechanisms and to make sure that the service providers and in the Indigenous service, pro service providers and Indigenous folks who are engaged in housing Indigenous populations in the urban context are part of that. Um, not, not just going to the, the, the well-established, um, based in Ottawa, often um, uh, indigenous groups like the AFN. Of course, you, you want the AFN involved, but I think there's like a, whole lot, a whole other realm of indigenous um, providers out there who need to be engaged. Just to really reiterate everything we want to just say, uh, I mean, one of the good things, again, back to the question of what the federal election results meant, I mean, one of the positives is that Trudeau made it very clear that he intends to bring back UNDRIP, uh, the ratification of UNDRIP, to this parliament, and that's a good thing, and we need to make sure that that actually gets passed and ratified, and not be faced with silly games in the Senate like we saw a few months ago. Um, and as Lillian very, very correctly said, UNDRIP makes it clear that Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination with respect to housing. Uh, we've developed, an, I don't know if you know, just saw our paper because you said exactly the words that it's titled, but we have a paper called the Four Indigenous by Indigenous Strategy, Bibi, Bibi Strategy, uh, which essentially says just that, that. No, it's not just about money, it's also very about, sorry, it's not just about money for bricks and mortars, it's also about cultural supports, and very importantly, it's about the governance and the oversight and the accountability that lies with Indigenous peoples themselves, and it's not just folks at CMHC uh, who, are, who are overseeing this. So it's, it's a, and, and most definitely, as you said, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are different cultural communities within the indigenous population. They need to be reflected in that housing strategy. I'm just going to give one little anecdote that I heard last week that I think is appropriate to this story. So it's really important to listen, and I think Lani was, it was shown in the film, and Lani was talking about it a little bit, to the experts of experience when it comes to precarious housing and homelessness. So I was talking to Janice Abbott, who is the head of the largest social housing organization in BC, which is a women's housing organization called Kira. And she has two households right now. One is an indigenous woman with eight kids, and one is a Palestinian refugee woman with eight kids. And their biggest unit, which is pretty common in social housing, is three bedrooms. And she's not allowed, or she's been told she's not allowed, using the national occupancy standards to provide a unit to either of those families because it would cause overcrowding. But if a care didn't provide that housing, then the, these two women and their eight children would probably end up in maybe a one bedroom or maybe a two bedroom um, basement unit somewhere in the private market. So there needs to be a lot of listening to people's experiences and responding to people's experience 
rather than the one size fits all. And although that example is an Indigenous woman talking about an Indigenous family and a refugee family, I think that it's a really important story to bring out that when the push comes to shove, we should be in the business of meeting people's needs, not trying to mold families into our notion of how people should live, you know? Yeah, oh, I, I have two questions. Hi, I'm Catherine. Um, so I was just wondering about, so in the documentary, the scene, I don't remember what country it was in, where the folks are basically being forced um, to displace violently. It, it kind of made me up nervous because it reminded me of um, a new provincial law, Bill 108, that my understanding is that it legalizes subcontracting of eviction, so you don't have to use the sheriff to get people out of their homes. And it kind of made me think about that and, I, and your comment, Leilani, about that all governments have to be held to international human rights standards. I didn't realize that, so that's kind of um, makes me feel better. Um, so I would wonder about something like that, Bill 108. So one question, I guess, is how legal is something like that or could it be challenged, potentially? Um, and then the other question I had that relates kind of to the comment about Vanier is that you know, there's so much around housing speculation and people being kind of pressured to leave their community and the lack of adequate affordable rental in areas like Bay. So folks need to leave their, need to want to sell their home and they can still stay in the community. Um, so I'm just wondering about, just, I was really struggling to figure out what the word is, I guess, for today in terms of people's, if they have a right to be in their area, they're preventing displacement anyway, so are the opposite displacement is. So, yeah, thanks. Um, so, Bill 108 and what you described, I actually didn't know anything about that, so that's really interesting. I'll, I will look that up. Um, but it, ra it um, raises the issue of subcontracting out your international human rights obligations. So you can't do that <laughs> if you're a government. So you can say, uh, so let's say you're in a whatever level of government. You say, well, I don't want to build housing because I'm, I, as a government, I'm not so good at building housing, but like builders are really good at building housing, so I'm going to let the builders build the housing. That's totally fine under international human rights law. But when that builder builds a faulty structure or a, roof, leafy, a leaky roof or it's, you know, whatever, not earthquake proof or whatever, then in fact, the responsibility lies with the government to regulate and make sure that that doesn't happen. And if it does happen, the responsibility is still on the government, right? So, so in that sense, the private actor has violated um, international, the international human rights obligations of the government. So the government has something really at stake when it subcontracts things out. And what's at stake is their reputation as having met or not met their international human rights obligations. So that would go to um, hiring um, subcontractors to do evictions. Um, they have to make sure that they're regulated and that they're abiding by uh, human rights and other uh, principles. I would just say that. Um, on this issue of um, displacement, so under international human rights law, it's like really clear. So like what happened in Harrogate is completely contrary to international human rights law. So there is a um, there are regulations and standards. I'm a bit, in fact, my, my last report will elucidate these very clearly. I'm, my last report is on the implementation of the right to adequate housing. It's a little bit of a ballsy move on my part because I'm trying to occupy the field to just say, okay, this is what you have to do to implement the right to housing. So all levels of government. Um, but we're bringing together all the stuff I've done and um, some stuff that other uh, UN bodies have, uh, standards UN bodies have established and jurisprudence has established. But basically, if you're living in a place and there's going to be some redevelopment, uh, first of all, no development should happen without cons full consultation, meaningful engagement with the community there. Um, you're supposed to explore all options um, and all viable options uh, before evicting anyone. And so that would mean, you know, say, okay, well, we need to redevelop this area because really this, these buildings are corrupt. Like they're just horrible. They're going to fall down. 
So we're going to make sure that you're relocated for a short period of time, the shortest period of time as possible, at an affordable place that's adequate. And then when these new buildings come up, we're going to re rehouse you, if that's what you want, at the same rent in a same footprint or larger or whatever. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, so, of course, that never happens, and we don't even have in the city of Ottawa, for example, as far as I know, we don't have any good processes around really engaging communities around development. So all the stuff that happened in Vanier, which I know nothing about, I'm sure happened without any community consultation or very little community consultation. I could go on and like, these, these standards are really like, there's a whole bunch of them, but that was the sketch. What does it mean uh, right to, to the housing? What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's so vague that actually you can, can make a lot of it. And, and part of the problem in Canada is that because there hasn't been that much national leadership for the last three decades, we don't have a consistent definition of affordable housing or adequate housing, we have these issues where overcrowding, um, again, it's probably better that someone be overcrowded, found to be overcrowded than not have a home uh, whatsoever. So uh, it's part of the challenge that we have in the years ahead to get over, to shake off four decades of stupid neoliberal policy that said that we can leave things in the hands of Blackstone and we're going to be happy, everyone's going to win. Well, everyone hasn't won, so we need to kind of find our own path. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the concepts that we're talking about, affordable housing and right to housing and so forth, they become real when you actually see the impact individual people. Yeah, um, so I think it's so big. It's big, but you know, but it, it, it doesn't become big when you see a fellow, you know, just give an example, I live on, one, just off um, line in the Street. Um, there's a fellow that in front of St. St. Patrick's Cathedral, almost every day for the past about a year when I go and walk my dog first thing in the morning, he's always there and he's always, you know, he's asking for money and he's homeless. Um, uh, about five, six months ago, he said, hey, you won't be but he has no idea that I'm involved in housing. He just kind of said this. He said, hey, I got a place. I got a place. It's, it's, it's OC8, Ottawa Community Housing Place. Uh, I got my own four, four walls. And he said, if you ever want me to take care of your dog, you know, bring them by if you happen to go up town or something. Ah, that's great. And that's what creates, that's what's the shift from vague kind of concepts to being real. And so I agree, sometimes this can kind of all seem very kind of pie in the sky type of stuff, but it's when it's those individual folks that actually whose lives have been changed because they suddenly have a roof over their heads, that's when it becomes tangible and concrete. And that's what we have to see more of. Because you're right, until we actually see those points where a fellow living on the street or a woman living on the street for X number of years suddenly has a roof over their heads and a place to call home, that's real. You know what, actually, I, I, I'll take issue with what you say. I don't find it vague at all. Um, so the, de the definition of that approach... It's part of the same thing that we need to make a different different series of different jurisdictions. What does it mean to be part of the same? What does it mean to be part of the same? It's just a number. Well, I think we'll, we'll let Leilani respond to, to, what, to what you were talking about and, and the, the definition. Well, if there's 100 units, then 25% would be 25 units, so I mean, it's pleasant. Uh, but there is a definition of adequate housing under international human rights law, and it says that everyone has the right to live uh, somewhere in peace, security, and dignity. And you could say to me that today, but I can tell you, when a homeless person has to defecate on a street because they don't have a toilet, they don't have... Dignity, that's pretty simple to me. They need a toilet. But a homeless person can't wash their hands because they don't have a sink, because they don't have any running water. It's very difficult for them to have dignity. So they need a sink with running water. It's very simple. When a homeless, right? I mean, I can go on and on. It's, and that is the broadest definition. There are actually seven criteria for adequate housing. Affordability is one of them. And it's defined really simply. That's what I love about the international human rights law. It's actually not rocket science. It's like practical and like straightforward. What's affordable? Affordable is what a household can manage based on their household income. 
And some people use a 30% rule. That's not an international law. It's really up to the household to determine what they can afford. Most of us would agree 90% of income is too high. But some families are quite comfortable at 50%, for example, because they have in-kind help. They have a grandma who's taking care of the kids. They've got you know dinner at sisters twice a week or whatever. And so for them, that works at 50%. So, so, and there's a whole bunch of other criteria. It has to be habitable, it has to be close to services, employment. The problem in this country, which I think Carolyn was getting at, is we don't have ways and mechanisms so far, but now with the housing advocate, this might change. For people who are experiencing, as Jeff said, who are experiencing violations of the right to housing, we haven't had places for them to come forward and say, I believe my right to housing has been denied, and this is why. And once we start creating those forum, and they have them in other countries, let me tell you, South Africa is a good example where people can actually go to court. Once that starts, those examples start coming forward, we, as a Canadian society, will start defining what the right to housing means here. And so we're at the beginning of this. It's a very exciting point in, in, in our history, I think. Right, it's, we're just at the beginning. So be patient, we'll figure out what the right to housing means here. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Thanks very much. I just wanted to say thank you to, to all three of you. We really appreciate it. Yes, and, uh, and I know that we, we have um, some people from um, uh, the shift that want to talk to us uh, and hopefully give them a couple more minutes. But thank you to Leilani, Jeff, and Carolyn. And I think we can all agree that the issue of housing is, is very broad. There's so many different aspects to it. Um, and I guess issues of housing or, or finance as we, as we can sort of look at it as well. But thank you very much to, to all three of you. And